Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have another episode of This Year in Perfume and it's going to be a ranked episode. So as you guys know, I've been kind of trying to slowly move forward into the point in time in my collection where we're going to be able to rank years. So we'll be able to just say 1981 ranked, 1982 ranked, and I'll be able to rank each fragrance in that year. Unfortunately, we started with uh, the times before the 1920s. I then did a video on the 1920s itself. So we have ranked videos on fragrances before the 1920s, the decade of the Roaring Twenties. I did a live stream where we talked about the 1930s in that live stream, and that's actually under the uh, This Year in Perfume uh, ranked playlist that you can find on the channel. And this is going to be the 1940s. Now, I barely have 10 fragrances in my collection from the 1940s to do a top 10. Some of them uh, are, you know, reformulations from maybe decades later. They're not the original from the 1940s, but they're basically the same fragrance. So, you know, we had to finagle things a little bit, but we got the 10 to do the top 10 countdown from the 1940s. Uh, but first, we have a couple of special surprises. Number one, we actually have an unboxing, um, and this is a special unboxing. It's from Senator Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. You're of senatorial rank with Channel Ram. I very much appreciate you working with me. Uh, he sent me some amazing unboxing. Uh, uh, he was part of the three-hour unboxing live stream I did a week or two ago, and one of the fragrances he sent me back then is actually my scent of the day, and it's the first time I'm smelling it or wearing it, and I'm actually enjoying it. It's, um, it's different and it's challenging, but I kind of like that a little bit. Uh, it's called Fleu de Fleur. So Fleu de Fleur was uh, a um, release of four fragrances that came out after the very first launch by Russian Adam and the Arise Le Dore brand. And Fleu de Fleur is a very interesting fragrance because actually if it wasn't for another fragrance I smelled that came out last year from his friend, uh, Russian Adam and Sultan Pasha are friends, and Sultan Pasha put out a fragrance called Sacred Scarab. And I talked a little bit about it yesterday on the live stream. I actually sprayed it on. Um, I have a separate smaller sample of this, and that's how I decided to grab this as my, uh, as one of the uh, 10 uh, or 5 10 ml uh, discovery set that I ended up getting from Zoologist. This I actually paid for with my own money, although um, Victor Wong was very kind enough to send me a bunch of 2ml samples. You can see a couple of them right there. I'm hoping to do a live stream tonight where we'll test uh, four zoologist fragrances I've never smelled before. We'll call it the Bird Series, if you will. Uh, it's going to be Nightingale, Snowy Owl, Dodo, and Hummingbird. So those are the four I've never... Some of the... I still have a lot of zoologist fragrances to go through, but... Um, one of my subscribers, uh, Margie Noir, specifically requested Nightingale. So I'm hoping to do these four on a live stream today, time permitting. But, um, Fleu de Fleur, very interesting. Listen to this note listing. Somalian frankincense, frankincense, pink grapefruit, jasmine sambac, frangipani, tuberose absolute, Cambodian oud, Sumatra oud, coconut water, Indian uh, amber, which actually I'll talk about in just a little bit. Siberian Deer Musk, real Siberian Deer Musk, Castorium, Blue Lotus Absolute, Honeysuckle, Henna, Vetiver, Tolu Balsam, and Benzoin. And listen to how he described it from when it originally came out. Heavy rain of melted frankincense coating a garden of, marvel of marvelous pink grapefruit. Resins covering citrus fruits, fixing and supporting their playful character. Liquid green frankincense releasing a tangy zing that is both juicy and resinous, while black frankincense delivers a dark, musky sensation. Once rain passes, the garden reveals its blooming florals, piercing narcotic tuberose, sweet, sharp, and stimulating jasmine sambac, and powdery, seductive yellow frangipani, Watered with black frankincense rain, all begin to blossom with notes of unimaginable dark, dry fruits. Slowly majestic, highly matured, rare Cambodian oud unfurls and stretches its ancient wings. Dark, thick, and dense, it reveals the notes of dry, oudy fruits, molasses resins, molasses is a good word for this, and plummy tobacco. Actually, I think that plummy tobacco is the oud. I honestly think it's the oud that's giving off that plummy tobacco-like feel because the oud here doesn't feel like the 
hardcore uh, animalic ouds that you get in other fragrances. Uh, it feels like it's adding this ambery, resinous, tobacco-like quality to it, if that makes sense. Graciously overlaying antique Shamama Atar. So the Shamama Atar is a very uh, famous Indian Atar from back in the day. And that's where that ambery bit comes from. That amber uh, that I mentioned in the note listing previously, I think that's from this Shamama Atar, this blend of spiced Atar. And... Um, it says aged for more than two decades. So the Shamama Atar was aged for more than two decades. Indian Amber Shamama Atar. Okay, I mentioned that. Legally obtained wild Siberian deer musk, castorium, blue lotus absolute, honeysuckle, and henna infusion, vetiver, tolu balsam, and benzoin. And I'll tell you what, it opens up kind of sweet. And the, um, the frankincense almost feels like it's um, buttery. Okay, so it's like a buttery, lemony frankincense. It's not like the harsh incense that you think, you know, many people, let me open this so we get better light. Sorry about that. I want you to be able to see a little bit better in here. So um, it's not like the, um, it's not like the incense, right? The frankincense in here almost feels like you're smelling, um, you know, buttery, lemony, uh, you know, the, the lemony teardrops of frankincense before they're, you know, uh, before you get that incense churchy facet, right? And it's very interesting. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fragrance that if I had never smelled Sacred Scarab, which this came out last year. So Fleur, Fleur de Fleur, like a bouquet of flowers, came out in 2017. I would not be able to compare this to anything had it not been for Sacred Scarab. And Sacred Scarab uh, adds a much deeper boozy plum wine. Yeah, there's this plum wine-like feel and civet. And this relies more heavily on the civet and the wine, but that floral bouquet that, Sult that Sultan Pasha created in Sacred Scarab, I get a little bit of in Fleur de Fleur. And I'm not sure if it's the Blue Lotus because that's such a unique note and it's used in both um, it's used in both fragrances. Um, but this is uh, this is a very unique floral fragrance. I don't know if I would um, you know if I had a choice. I don't know if I like this enough to go for a full bottle. But I'm very glad to have got to experience it. It's always a pleasure to get to learn you know about Russian Adams uh, previous works okay because they're always amazing to me so uh let's get into the uh unboxing because there actually is another unboxing again thanks to eddie senator eddie thank you my friend um this is a very special uh unboxing because it's actually going to be my very first nsar okay so let me show you what i ended up going for it's my very first nsar and okay, here we go. Aha. All right, here we go. Here we go, here we go. This is going to be a great unboxing. I'm so excited. Oh, I can't wait to see this. My first bottle of Insar that I've ever held in my hands. I've held a lot of samples and a lot of decants, but never the full bottle. But first, there is a little um, atar that he sent me, and he told me he was sending me this. Uh, this is the uh, Sultan Pasha prototype atar that he ended up getting sent to him a couple years back. Now, I have no experience with atars, and I have almost no experience with um, Sultan Pasha's atars. The only Sultan Pasha work I know, and I've been impressed with both, uh, is Civet de Nuit for Ariz Ladore and Sacred Scare for Zoologists that we just talked about. And that's it. I know nothing of his Atars. His Atar work is actually what ended up putting him on the map. And so um, he did reach out to me recently, or, um, you know, we connected via uh, Instagram. And he told me he was going to send me some of his work so I could um, kind of explore this, uh, this Atar uh these atars that he created that really put him on the map. And apparently this is very dense and very thick. And you really only need 
You really only, oh wow, you really only need one swipe is what Eddie was telling me. Oh wow. It's like a, it's like one of those Russian dolls where they just get smaller and smaller and smaller as you open it up. Man, the only thing I don't like about these Atars is every time I... So I've got a couple of them now, and each time the, the juice is like just all over the cap. You can't get it out without just getting it all over your fingers. I can smell it almost without even opening it up. Um, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait on opening it up. It smells fantastic just from the, uh, from, from the outside. So... So yes, this little prototype Atar from Sultan Pasha, I don't even know what to call it. I'll have to ask for more information. Maybe I'll ask Sultan Pasha when he comes on the channel. He mentioned he was, uh, that he would be down to come on one day, so I'm going to take him up on that. Uh, but thank you for that little gift, Eddie. Uh, let's open up this, uh, let's open up the big boy, the Ensar. All right, let's see what we get here. This is exciting stuff, my very first Ensar. My very first Ensar Oud. Mm -mm -mm. Ramsey's all grown up, boys and girls. Ramsey's all grown up. All right, let's see what we get here. Ah, what a beauty. Okay, so this is... So this is E-O, number one. And I did a video on this. Um, mm I did a video on this, and you can see the way that he set this up. So here's his bottles. Look at the color of that juice. Oh, baby. Come to Papa. And so um, these little things right here, this little leather pouch, these are actually handmade by the same person that makes the leather pouch that goes around the uh, Pope's Bible. He's a very famous leather maker. And uh, I don't know his name, but I'm sure you could look it up. Uh, and these are all made by hand. Each one of these is individually handcrafted for Ensar's bottles. Very cool. Uh, very cool little, little collector's item, if you will, that kind of sets it apart. Mm. Oh, man, I can't wait to wear this. Okay, so there, there it is. Ensar uh, EO number one. A blessing to have in the collection. Thank you, Eddie. I know... Uh, I know that you wanted this to have a good home. I also know that you probably could have got even more money if you just, um, you know, put it out to the ethosphere and whoever paid the most would have gotten it. But thank you for, you know, working with me and, and being fair. Um, and, you know, there's actually a second package from uh, the great Eddie coming very soon. And so I, um, I can't wait to... Uh, I can't wait to, um, wow, that's really cool. I can't wait to, uh, to, to do the second unboxing, do the second unboxing. So, so yes, thank you again. I very much do appreciate it. This is awesome. Uh, where are you going to live, Mr. Ensar Oud packaging? Huh? Where are you going to live? Um... I need to think about this. Uh, I guess you can live right here with the Roja samples for now. That seems like a good place for you. We'll find we'll find a better spot for you later. Okay. All right. So uh, let's do this top ten fragrances from the 1940s. So here's the thing about the uh, 1940s. Actually, I'm gonna open up a water before we get going. The last one. We'll get to you later, Mr. Fiji. Okay. So, the 1940s, um, you know, when I think about the 1940s, obviously it's kind of split up in two halves in my mind because one half of the decade was obviously World War II and all the uh, tumultuous, terrible things that happened to humanity in World War II. Uh, you know, humanity basically ripped itself apart and the second half of the 1940s I see is like the bringing back together, the mending of that. Although when you really think about it, um, 
uh, after World War II ended with uh, two nuclear bombs being detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then, of course, the collapse of the, the, uh, the Nazi Empire, because they had really expanded. If you look at a map, of course, you see how much of Europe the Nazis had kind of expanded over, and then, of course, they collapsed back down into themselves, and all of the, you know, terrible post-war aftermath that ended up coming out, um, and so, you know, that's a very tumultuous time. Just think about, I was thinking about this the other day, actually, as I was kind of brewing on this video in just the 1940s in general. Think about all of the money spent on tanks and aircraft and the lives cost and the manpower and the, you know, shipbuilding and just all of the stuff, uh, the guns that were being made, the ammo, the bombs, the fuel. Just think of all the stuff that went into World War II that imagine if humanity had like made that, um, had put that amount of effort and resources into bettering mankind as a whole. Just imagine how much different we would be as a species, but we just have this inherent need for war and conquer and power. And you actually saw it at the end of World War II, as soon as it collapsed and everything collapsed and the war was over, it, you know, Sitting back from afar in 2023 and thinking about it, you would think, okay, that's it. The war is over. There has to be some time of peace, right? No. Instantly, now there's this confrontation between Russia and the United States because Russia took land and then, you know, communism spreading and we went into Korea and it's like it just never ended, you know? Uh, it did end, but of course it never did really end. The affliction that kind of afflicts the human species, um, it never really uh, it wasn't like it just took a break. It just kind of moved on to something else. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's interesting to think about the 1940s because, um, you know, just the first half of the decade had that tumultuous war. The second half was that I think of it as a time of like rehealing. And there's actually a fragrance we're going to talk about today that is, um, centered around that theme of, of rehealing the human race and bringing back together in peace on earth and all of this stuff. Um, so, first of all, it's a top 10. Now, these are all according to me, and some of these I really struggled with where to put them. I've been working on this for a while. I moved things, I moved them back, I then moved them back again, I then moved them back, and, and this is kind of how I finally have it set up. Um, so, these are all from the 1940s. These fragrances came out in the 1940s. Uh, some of them, again, I've taken some leeway because maybe like ones in uh, concentrate version that I think came out a couple years after, or maybe even a decade after, but we're going to talk about the original because I wanted to make it a top 10. So top 10, number 10 on this list is going to be a fragrance that was originally issued from the house of Victor. And I think now it ended up, um, being issued or now it is being marketed by Perfalina and the, the, um, Parfum house is Visconti D. Uh, Madrone, Visconti di Madrone, but it was originally from the house of Victor, and if you guys know this bottle, you know it's basically Aqua de Selva number 10. Now, we're going to do something I don't always do. I'm going to smell these while we're talking about them. Since there's only 10 of them, I'm going to smell them, and here's the thing. This is basically this green, herbal, minty, lavender. Uh, I've got my little... Uh, I've got my blotter. I'm just going to try to stick. I'm just going to try to fold this and dip it in there. We'll turn the blotter into a dipstick. Okay. All right. So, here we go. Yeah, so it's this uh, very green, uh, herbal, fresh, mossy, piney, lavender fragrance that actually, you know, now that I'm looking at this and I'm really thinking about it and smelling it again, it came out in 1949, by the way. It came out at the very end of the 40s. Um, and Aqua de Selva is kind of, to me, if you've ever, uh, in the 1930s, there was a fragrance that came out that was called Skin Bracer. Um, if you've ever smelled Skin Bracer, or actually, now that I'm even thinking about it, there's a fragrance that I think I have in my collection that I like even more, and it's called, um, 
It's called Agua de Brava. We'll get to this in the next couple decades by the great late uh, Rosen du Matou. And this is a little bit of that same idea, that herbal lavender, but I think I like this better. Yeah, I don't know how much I like the um, the minty bit in Aqua de Selva. That's kind of what bothers me a little bit, is there's that big minty hit, and it, it you know, some people um, talk about the mint and stuff like, uh, you know, Roadster or something like that. Here, it's just so bracing. It's like, um, it's it's almost like, you know, clears your sinus passages bracing, that kind of thing. Uh, it's listed as an eau de cologne, and it really does only last, I think, three hours or so on the skin, maybe three or four hours tops. Uh, it's one of those things you're going to have to reapply. Um, and I have this little 25 mil bottle. I didn't pay much for it. And thank God I didn't pay much for it because it's just not my thing. There's another green fragrance that's going to be coming up later that I like much more. But that focuses much more on neroli, which is a very expensive ingredient. Um, and so from 1949, Aqua de Selva, Eau de Cologne by uh, Victor. I think it was originally Victor. Now it's uh, Visconti di Madrone is who's, who's issuing it. Again, it's basil, bergamot, lavender, rosemary, lemon, carnation, geranium, clary sage, pine, thyme, moss, musk, tonka bean, vetiver, and cedar wood. But it just comes across as smelling very bracing, minty, uh, extremely herbal lavender. Not the vintage, even though it's a vintage fragrance, the lavender doesn't come across as smelling like the vintage lavender that we love so much from the 70s and 80s. To me, it smells completely different. Um, I think just that herbal mintiness makes it tough for me to wear. So, so yes, I mean, if you like that bracing freshness, you know, like this would be great maybe after a shave um, just straight on freshly shaved skin, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that's what Skin Bracer was all about as well. And this kind of followed in the footsteps, I felt like. Uh, but there's other lavenders, herbal, you know, fresh green fragrances, mossy, that I think I like a little bit more. So yes, Aqua de Selva. Uh, let me make a note so I don't, um, forget what's what. Not that I could ever, um, not that I could ever mistake that for anything else but just to be safe we'll say aqua of course the pen doesn't work aqua de selva okay aqua de selva yeah it's not terrible it's just not my uh, it's not my favorite so it comes in at number 10 number nine is um actually one of the most famous fragrances in the world and we'll also do another We'll uh, turn this into a, this blotter into a dipstick here. Let me write it on here first so I don't have to mess with doing that again. Um, and this fragrance is the one that I was telling you about. Literally um, kind of focused its entire marketing around Peace on Earth. And if you've ever seen the original bottles, uh, they have two beautiful doves on top of the cap. The old school bottles do. The bottle was desi designed by the great Lalique. Um... And it's kind of this uh, whole idea around, you know, every time a woman would dab this on their skin, they would be basically be sending out this message of peace into the universe, if you will, this idea of peace. Because this is 1948, so this is one year before Aqua de Selva, but still only a couple years after the end of World War II. So you can imagine, uh, three years after the end of World War II, this came out, and uh, everyone was tired of the fighting and they were tired of the wars and death and all that stuff. And so this fragrance was all about um, peace, peace on earth. It's a floral powdery fragrance and it's called Lea du Temps by Nina Ricci. And this is a bottle, I don't really know when it's from, but I'm guessing because it's got the 82 proof here that it's probably from the 80s um, is my guess. I really don't know. Could be 70s, 80s, I, I don't know. But it's a floral, powdery scent. And this is one of those that I think I appreciate the idea and I appreciate the um, construction. It was created by Francois Fabron. And so I think I appreciate the idea and the construction and all of that stuff more than I enjoy wearing it myself. You know what I mean? I think it's something I would enjoy smelling on other people more than I would enjoy wearing it myself because 
Yeah, it's just got that fresh floral powdery. Uh, there's bergamot, neroli, peach. The peach is really nice, to be fair. The peach note in here is very nice with rosewood and spices. So it's like um, the neroli makes everything very fresh, you know. And if you look at the color of the juice, you can tell it's almost like this fresh take on, um, you know, the juice color isn't isn't dark. Um, it's um, it's really kind of a, a bright yellowish juice color, and that's kind of how the fragrance smells. The neroli is very prominent in the opening. But it begins to dry down, and the part that I like about the fragrance the most is the dry down. You know, the opening, I think you get a lot of flowers. Uh, you get a lot of flowers and um, that fruitiness. So it's a fruity, powdery floral for the first half of its life. And this really will remind some of Grandma. It just will. You're going to have that association because of the time that it came out. I say Grandma smelled amazing. Um especially compared to some of the crap that, you know, they're putting out nowadays. So this is an out and out classic. It survived the test of time. Nina Ricci is still actually selling Le du Temps today. I don't know what the modern version is like, but I can tell you that this version is really beautiful. Don't think because it's number nine, it's bad. No, I had to, it was very hard for me to rank this because all of these are basically classics. Even Aqua de Selva is, is, is a classic. You know, when I think of Aqua de Selva, I think of some Italian dad, dropping off their kids to school in the 70s or 80s or something like that and just, you know, splashing on half a bottle of Aqua de Selva after having a fresh shave. Um, so even the, the final fragrance on the list, even though it's not my favorite kind of fragrance, this, um, that, yeah, that very sharp, minty, uh, nostril clearing, you know, mint thing. I can really appreciate it. Le du Temps, I think I would even wear this over Aqua de Selva. Just because of how beautiful it is, the, um, the florals come across as um, perfectly blended, you know, nothing really major stands out. You get a little bit of carnation, rose, elaine, iris, orchid, and lily. Big floral note heart. That's the thing is, this is one of those fragrances where I appreciate smelling it on a blotter like this, or I would love to smell this on my wife or something like that, but um, I don't know how much I would really in enjoy wearing this as my scent of the day. Usually what I do with Laird du Temps, if I get the urge to wear it or if I realize, hey, I haven't smelled this in a long time, I want to kind of refresh the old memory bank, I'll wear this to bed. So I'll just wear it to bed. I can get a couple hours in before I go to sleep of breaking it down, but I don't have to wear it, wear it as my scent of the day. But what I really like about it is the dry down. After a couple hours, you start to get more of the woods. Uh, and there's a beautiful sandalwood and cedarwood combination in here. And the sand sandalwood is like it used to be done in the old days. I don't know what type of sandalwood it is. Um, excuse me. But I do know that there's this beautiful, creamy... Um, sparkly woody dry down with moss and the the fragrance turns it basically loses uh its powdery floral bit as it gets closer and closer to the to the final dry down and it turns more and more woody sparkly and uh, mossy and it so basically it becomes more and more masculine it starts out very feminine like if you just spray this and you instantly make a split second decision if you're a guy you won't like this okay You'll think, whoa, this is grandma, this is way too floral for me. But if you just wait, even now it's already starting to turn. And um, if you just wait a couple hours, let the powdery florals begin to fade. Let it lose some of that, um, you know, uh, that fruity, spicy, floral, powdery bit. And let some of the woods come out. Um, and it turns really beautiful much more unisex as it goes into the dry down, maybe even leaning masculine. I mean, sandalwood, cedar, vetiver, ambergris, oak moss. I mean, those are masculine notes. So yes, um, Le du Temps, I would say, give it a try. It's If you've never smelled it before, it's uh, it's not hyped. No one hypes Le du Temps, almost no one. I think I've seen Bernardo um, from another fragrance reviewer, I think is his channel, another fragrance reviewer, uh, he's talked about Le Du Temps and how much he's really fallen in love with it. He's the only one I can think of. No one else talks about Le Du Temps, but it's a classic. 
The story around it is amazing, very nostalgic, brings you back to, you know, it really brings you back to a time that um, many of probably the people watching this as parents weren't even alive in 1948. You know, it's great. You're probably your grandparents who, who were alive in, in, in the 40s. And so, yeah, it's just a great piece of fragrance history to, to kind of get to know. And I love stuff like that. That That's, I mean, that's kind of one of the things that I love about the fragrance journey for me is that there's always something else to kind of learn about. And right when you think you know it all, you realize you don't really know anything. If you think you have it all figured out, that's when you know you need to go back and do your homework again because you probably don't know anything. Uh, that's one thing that I learned. If you're on the side of the majority, here, here's what I learned, just a life lesson from, from the Ram. If you ever find yourself on the side of the majority, you probably need to step back and really kind of look at things. I think there was a Mark Twain quote that was very similar to that somewhere. But um, if, if, if I ever find myself on the side of what everyone else is doing, that's like a big blinking red flag to me. I want to stop and go in a different direction. You know, that's just the way I live my life. Okay, so that was number uh, nine. Number eight. Number eight is a new addition to my uh, wardrobe. And looking at the note listing, I was like, shit, I'm going to love this. Like, this is 100% my uh, cup of tea. This is exactly the kind of fragrance I love. And then I got it in and sprayed it, and I was like, I don't know about this one. Um, so we'll put this one, we'll put on a bigger blotter. Whenever I went to the mall the other day, I got these Donna Karen blotters for free. So I figured let's let's use them up. Um, so this is a fragrance by the House of Parfums Wheel. Parfums Wheel. And it's called Antelope. Now, this is the Parfum de Toilette. You can kind of see that down there on the bottom. Parfum de Toilette. This is a 30 ml bottle that I ended up getting for a very reasonable price. And I think part of the reason that this so threw me off is because there's this very strange aldehydic opening, extremely strange. It almost smells like the spices and the aldehydes mixed with the flowers in this almost smell like you are um, smelling something slightly decaying, you know? It has that slight bit of decay and um, that slight bit of decay kind of got me. Yeah, it, the first couple of times I smelled this, I was like, now I know what to expect. So I was kind of ready for it. But uh, the first couple of times that I've smelled this really took me by surprise. And, you know, I'm reading the note listing and then in the note, there's stuff like ambergris, vetiver, Russian leather. I saw that Russian leather note and it's a floral shepra. So it's, it's technically classified as a floral shepra. Okay. Um, but what you get at the opening is slight bit of citrus, a lot of aldehydes and spices in this decaying floral note. And I was like, what in the world is this? This is not what I was expecting at all. And this is another one kind of like Lair du Temps. And it just goes to show how different perfumes were kind of created back in the day, um, where nowadays the perfumer feels like they have like 15 seconds to grab your attention. You know, you go to the mall, you spray something. Those first 15 seconds are all they have to grab your attention. And then they just move on to something else. That's the modern day consumer. Back in the day, people used to buy a fragrance because they trusted the perfumer. This was actually done by Hubert Frace. Uh, and the Frace, I think, the, I think he had a brother who was even more popular than him. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that, that name seems very familiar. Um, and, you know, it's um, it's another one where if you think about the way people used to, um, if you think about the way that people used to buy fragrances back in the day, which by the way, Antelope came out in 1945, okay? So Antelope was probably... Uh, one of the most fam famous fragrances in the year 1945. It was a it was a big hit for the brand of Parfums Wheel. And uh, there's a pure parfum, and I'm very curious as to what that would smell. This is the Parfum de Toilette, but Parfum de Toilette was a verbiage that many houses used in the 1980s to name because 
they didn't really have like a industry-wide name for the different concentrations back then like they did today. So for example, uh, Dior used Esprit de Parfum um, and uh, Chanel used like Cologne Concentré and Guerlain used Parfum de Toilette, Caron used Parfum de Toilette, right? Uh, and, and they were all basically different ways of saying Eau de Parfum. They didn't have like a like a generalized, this is the Eau de Cologne, Eau de Toilette, Eau de Parfum, you know, Parfum Extra, whatever it is. So they didn't have that standardized version. So now, even now that it's starting to dry, it's getting better and better and better. And this is a, actually a great lesson for the 1940s. And older fragrances in general, don't judge it by its cover. If you're a perfume lover, you really have to let this dry down. You have to let the fragrance tell its story because what happened is back in the day, people took this home and they basically said, I trust the perfumer. I know there's a story being told here and it's on me to take the time to learn that story, right? Uh, they didn't just have the ability to throw it away and go to the mall and buy another one, you know, from the thousand. Now we're just drowning in perfume releases. Like the amount of releases nowadays is insane. Uh, if, if you tried to keep up with everything, if you tried every single new fragrance, you would basically spend your entire life trying new stuff because there's just, you could try five, 10 things a day and be behind the eight ball. Stuff just comes out nowadays. Like you wouldn't believe back in the day, it wasn't like that. And so the population basically had their brand that they trusted. Some people trusted Chanel, some people trusted Guerlain, some people trusted Violet, some people trusted um, Caron or, or Parfum d'Orsay or, or Parfum's Wheel or whatever it is. They had their brand and they stuck with it, you know, and they went and bought something new from the brand that they loved. And they took it home and they tried to learn about it. And they spent months and a year until the bottle was gone learning about it, you know, and that was their thing. And it was a different mindset back then. So you have to give these older fragrances time. This is 1945. World War II was possibly still going on while this was being released, right? Depending on which part of 1945 it was released, the earlier, the latter part. And so, you know, you have to, you have to understand it was a completely different mindset back then. However, um, that opening is challenging, even for me. I smell this and I'm like, wow. But if you give it a chance to dry, give it a chance for the florals to stop feeling so decayed. It's almost like the florals go in reverse, you know, like you watch a flower kind of wilt and die. When you're spray spraying antelope, it feels like you're watching a wilted flower almost like come back to life. And once that woody vetiver and the leather comes out, in the... Again, two, three, four hours in, that's where I think antelope really shines. But you have to have patience. This is not a spray and love at first scent. Or I doubt there's very few people on earth that would spray and just have love at first scent with this. No. This is a learn to love scent, okay? So that's number eight. And it's uh, Parfum's Wheel Antelope. Number seven is, again, one of the uh, most... Um, I would say one of the most popular vintage fragrances, this is kind of one where when you talk about the milestones in perfumery, this one has to come up. It's a Jacques Fat creation. It came out in 1947, and this is called Green Water. Shout out to my friend uh, Antonio from Italy for finding this bottle for me. This is a very hard to find vintage bottle. And the thing about these older, um, the thing about these older, uh, bottles of green water is that green water was famous for something back in the day. It was famous for being the perfume that used the uh, highest amount of Neroli, Petit Grand, uh, very expensive. Neroli is a very expensive ingredient and people don't realize just how expensive Neroli is. So here's the bottle. Beautiful bottle, right? Really symbolizes what the fragrance stands for. This is the um, Eau de Toilette. See right there, 90 proof. And so we are going to, are we going to dip this or are we going to spray it? Let's see. I think we are going to 
I think we are going to spray this because I actually de I actually decanted some of this already. So what I'm going to do, I decanted a little bit right here. So I'm going to spray this onto one of those onto one of those awful Donna Karen ad uh, blotters. But I, I wanted to show you guys the bottle. This was created by Vincent Robea. Again, another all time great perfumer. He actually made some of uh, my favorite fragrances from back in the day. For example, he did uh, Caniche 10, and he did a fragrance for Coty called uh, La Aminant. I would love to smell that. And he did Iris Gris, which is known as one of the uh, best Irish fragrances of all time. I actually did a top 100 Irish fragrance. I'm never doing a top 100 again. Took two episodes, and this ended up being number one which is uh, Jacques Fat, La Iris de Fat Parfum. Uh, very, very expensive stuff right here. But uh, as far as pure Iris fragrances go, the original from 1947 that they put out, Iris Gris, is known as like the Iris fragrance. The Iris fragrance to end all irises. So let's spray this uh, green water. Woo! Oh, the Neroli instantly. What's so crazy about this? Okay, so this is what's so crazy about this to me. This is an old bottle. Old, okay? I don't know how old, but I'm telling you it's old. Uh, you can just tell it's old by everything about it. The uh, way it's all written, 90 proof, 75 mil, two and a half fluid ounces. I mean, even the bottom of the bottle, you can tell it's old, right? Uh, the, the box, the way the Jacques Fat logo is, it's, it's an old bottle. This is fresh as the day it was made. Uh, it smells fresh as the, day it, as the day it was made. I know that my brother Antonio from Italy stored this properly, uh, but even with proper storage, you might expect, hey, citruses are kind of volatile. You know, it might be, um, it might be kind of one of those things where, you know, the neroli, the orange, the lemon, the peppermint, the bergamot, all kind of comes across as um, maybe smelling a little harsh in the beginning. No, nothing like that at all. It is beautiful from the get-go. And actually, green water takes Aqua de Selva out to the woodshed and just, you know, beats it like a red-headed stepchild. It is superior to Aqua de Selva in every way for me. And actually, green water is probably what... Uh, the House of Victor and the House, you know, the Aqua de Selva green marketing and all that stuff. Green water is probably what what inspired that fragrance is my guess. Uh, because it's just, it's so fresh. It's so green. It's got the, um, it's got the lavender note in that I was complaining about in Aqua de Selva. But here it's just used so perfectly. And it dries down to this musk, musky um, tonka bean, but not that modern crap that you're thinking of, you know, not that modern, disgusting, synthetic tonka that you are, that the modern designer houses have trained you to think about tonka. This is completely different. It's so uh, natural. It's so natural. It's like It's like being in a... It's like being in, it's like walking through a botanical garden and smelling fresh lavender, fresh neroli. Probably the best one. Pro See, the thing is, is I like neroli in a couple designer fragrances that most people don't like. So, for example, I like Dunhill Icon. I like the neroli in, um, there is a Rochas fragrance that I've come to really like that has a Neroli note called Rochas Louis, L-U-I. And this is discontinued, but this is almost like, uh, this is almost like Abbey Rouge meets green water um, in a strange kind of way, or, or Abbey Rouge meets, uh, you know, Dunhill's Icon or something like that. Uh, it's, 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 uh, no one talks about it anymore because it's hard to find. It's very expensive. Uh, but the Neroli in, in Rochas Louis is beautiful. So I do like Neroli in some fragrances, but many times it kind of puts me off. Um, there's just something about it. 
it can sometimes smell kind of like a clean sheet, okay? And it can have this uh, designer musk feel. But here, there's none of that. It's, I completely see why uh, the freshness and the beauty of Jacques Fat Green Water was kind of passed down over the decades. And this version, this vintage eau de toilette is discontinued. Here, there's a little blurb about it. Composed of a very masculine aroma. Ah, back before masculine was a dirty word. I love it. Composed of a very masculine aroma. Dry, vigorous, green. This toilet water leaves an enduring sensation of wholesome freshness on the skin. That is very true. Use it liberally all over the body. Well, all right. Jet green water note. Hesper Hesperidia and aromatic herbs with a base of wood. It's actually a very good way to um, to describe it. It's very hesperitic. It's very green. The neroli is stunning. It's so fresh. And, you know, there's a, um, interestingly enough, there's a Creed fragrance that I got a sample of. I don't have a full bottle because it's very expensive. Um, let's see if I can find what that fragrance is real quick. I, um, I got a sample from a friend at a very fair price and it's called Selection Vet from 1970 and actually if you look at the note listing of Selection Vet only because of my experience with green water did I if I hadn't smelled green water I never would have put the two together but only because of my experience with green water as soon as I smelled Selection Vet I went this is Creed's take on green water, hundred percent. Not even a doubt in my mind. There's not a there's not a uh, slither of doubt in my mind that Selection Vet by Creed, which is I think discontinued, um, is green. Is their take on green water? It's neroli. It's citrus notes. It's a little bit more peppery than green water, and it has that Creed ambergris in the base. Uh, but it has the peppermint, it has the herbs, it has the neroli, it has, it's a niche take on green water. And actually, I think green water's better, to be honest with you. Selection Verts is a little bit sharp. Uh, the peppermint makes it a little bit sharp. This just smells so natural, so beautiful. Um, again, it's, it's at number seven because the reason it's at number seven is because these type of fragrances are not my favorite to wear. So I'll wear it begrudgingly in summer, you know, but I very rarely go, oh, I, I want to smell like green water all day. No, I don't. This fresh, um, like they said, hesperitic freshness doesn't move me. Uh, it doesn't move me. You know, it it's summer like nine months of the year in Texas, so I should be able to get a lot of wear out of good old green water. But uh, it's not my favorite. Okay, so that was, uh, we had 10, 9, 8, 7. Number 6. Now, this is the one I kind of cheated on a little bit because uh, this is basically uh, a bit of a flanker to the great um, Moustache by Rochas from 1949. This is uh, Moustache Eau de Toilette Concentré. So the original, I believe, was an eau de cologne. Don't quote me on it, but I think it was an eau de cologne. And I think it came out in 1949. And it's an Edmund Rudnitska. And his wife, Teresa Rudnitska, is also listed as the perfumer of this. And I remember Pierre Bourdon saying that um, Edmund Rudnitska would scoff whenever his wife would say that she created mustache. Um, he was kind of a tough person to work for. And so I don't own the original, but I hear that the Eau de Toilette is basic, or the Eau de Toilette Concentré, which I have, is basically just like the original Moustache, just more amped up, more concentrated. It's green, it's citrusy, it's a Chypre. It's basically a classic Chypre. It's a Chypre in the same way that the Eau de Toilette of um, Chanel Pour Monsieur is a, is a Chypre, Okay. And if you take a look, you can kind of see Rochas Eau de Toilette Concentré. 
100 mil. Um, here, let's spray this, shall we? And I'll go through the notes with you. Woo! Man, my thumb on this hand is going to smell like everything. Okay, so I like this. Uh, this has grown on me. I've, I've only had it for three or three months now, two or three months maybe. can't remember. Maybe four, but somewhere. It hasn't been more than half a year for sure. And um, so it's really grown on me because that DNA of citrus, the citrusy aromatic sheepra, I don't know how to call the old school sheepras from back in the day, you know, the uh, Chanel, Pour Monsieur, Eau de Toilettes and stuff like that. They're not my favorite. Actually, they're my least favorite type of Shepra. I would much rather wear Mitsuko. I would much rather wear uh, Diagalev or something like that, okay? That's much more my speed of Shepra. So this type of Shepra, the citrusy green um, style of Shepra, never really appealed to me. I always thought they were kind of thin and all this stuff. The Eau de Toilette Concentre solves that, though. And maybe the original mustache was a little thin and all that good stuff in the cologne version. But for me, the concentrate version really solves that. It's beautiful lavender. And it's got that Edmund Rudnitska bit. You know, when I think of Edmund Rudnitska fragrances, the first couple minutes are always off-putting. Because, or they should be off-putting. Because he wants to challenge you, okay? He wants to, you know, he wants to uh, shock you. That's the thing, is his fragrances kind of shock you into, um, they kind of shock you into uh, trying to understand what he's what he's getting at. So this has basil, bergamot, lemon, petit gras, more lemon, sorry, said lemon twice. Lemon ver, uh, vervain is the second one. With the heart of carnation, beautiful spicy uh, carnation comes out here. With geranium, honey, jasmine, and rose. And the honey, I think, is the bit that pushes this for me, because I'm a honey lover. I love Hugo Boss number one. I love Tenere. Rest in peace. Um, Francisco Robanetta, Paco Raban, by the way, he passed away yesterday. Rest in peace to him. Um, since I mentioned Tenere by Paco Raban. But even there's honey in Paco Raban Por Homme. I love honey. I, I'm an I'm an I'm a sucker for honey. I uh I did a whole honey video, you can check it out. I did a This Is Not A Top 10 Honey fragrance video. And the honey here adds that little bit that I just, I absolutely adore. Um, I love that extra bit of honey and what it adds to the, to, the, to the creation. There's then amber, oak musk, musk, tonka bean, vanilla, and cedar. And so I don't think even the note listing is different by one note. I think the note listing is exactly the same on the Eau de Toilette Concentre. I just think this came out a decade or two after the original mustache Eau de Toilette. But I'm using it for this video so we can, you know, have a top 10. Um, but yes, if you're a fan of Edmund Rudnitska's work, if you like... Um, there's actually a Frederick Mall fragrance called Le Parfum uh, de Therese, I believe. Uh, that has a little bit more leather in the dry down, but it keeps this Shepra construction that he he's made so beautifully. He did Diorella. Um, you know, so this Shepra construction that he so beautifully works on, and, and his name will pop up again. If you know fragrances from the 1940s, his name is coming up again. But yes, the oak moss, uh, the ambery vanilla tonka dry down just puts this a little bit ahead of something like Chanel's uh, Pour Monsieur Eau de Toilette for me. It's very good. Very good, Monsieur Rudnitska. Well, well done, sir. Glad to get to know that. Okay, so that was... Um, I guess I should have actually wrote these numbers down. Mustache was number six. Number five. Now this I struggled with. This was almost number four. I went back and forth with number four, number number five, number four. It ended up being number five, but it was damn close to being number four. Um, even now I'm like, should I change it to number four real quick? I'm going to leave it alone. I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, but this is very, very good. This was a uh, shocking find. And I have to give a special shout out to my friend Anuj from Enchante Perfumes. He sent this to me with an order that I did. 
uh, and it just blew my mind. I mean, as far as aldehy aldehydic florals go, I would much rather wear this over something like Chanel Number no. 5 or, you know, just the beauty of this fragrance stunned me. It's a stunning floral Chypre, uh, and, and I, I, it just captured my heart for whatever reason. I don't know why, uh, but I love it. And it's from the house of Balenciaga, and it's called La Dix. Okay, so... It's an old tester that Anu sent to me. Again, look at the presentation. Beautiful. Beautiful presentation. The Balenciaga bees. Yesterday when I talked about Paco Rabanne's passing, I mentioned his mother was a seamstress for the house of Balenciaga. That's how he kind of got brought into the fashion world, if you will. And this is a floral Chypre. Lots of aldehydes in the opening, but beautiful aldehydes. I mean... Aldehydes like I've only smelled in L'Envon's Arpege X-Ray from the 20s. The aldehydes here are out of this world. Bergamot, a um, little bit of herbal coriander, peach, lemon, and then that floral heart. The lilac, iris, jasmine, lily of the valley, and rose mid reminds me a little bit of Mitsuko. Um, there's a little bit of Mitsuko in here. There's a little, like I said, a little bit of the Chanel aldehydes in the top, a little bit of Mitsuko, which does not surprise me at all. I mean, those were giants uh, back in the day and still are. Um, with a base of amber, benzoin, musk, sandalwood, tonka bean, and vetiver. And again, there's just something. This is not the kind of fragrance that I would usually reach for because I prefer, you know, if I'm going to wear a Shepra, like I said, uh... It's usually going to be something more animalic. It's going to be something maybe like a leather Chypra, Antaeus, or whatever it may be. But this is so well done that I just can't help but I just can't help but fall in love with it. I mean, it's uh, it, I, and I wasn't prepared. I had no clue what this was when this was sent to me. I didn't buy it. He gave it to me as a freebie for my order. Uh, and what a uh, what a discovery this is that I really put my hat on I uh, put my discoverers hat on you know you know call me Ramsey Marco Polo you know just the discovery aspect of this was stunning I love Ladis and I'm so glad to have this bottle and I'll have to do a review on the channel one day the ingredients smell so high quality you would have you have no idea the high quality level of the ingredients this is the eau de toilette I think Balenciaga, yeah, eau de toilette, 90 proof. Yep. So number five is Ladis. If you guys have any experience with these, please leave your information in the comments about your experience with them. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, number four. Number four is a fragrance that kind of gets uh, a bad rap because the house itself is a zombie house. It's been resurrected. It's died. It's been resurrected again by, you know, the moneyed interest who are trying to make money off of it. But the scent itself... Is amazing and it's actually a Russian leather okay so here's the thing uh, when it came out in 1949 Russia was the enemy like I said after World War II uh, and all of the land that Russia kind of captured on its way to um, to Berlin uh, Russia and the United States had their issues obviously capitalism versus communism right and this fragrance uh, was originally supposed to be called Russian leather but they decided that Russian leather wouldn't have been a good name in 1949. It wouldn't have sold uh, because the Russians were the enemy. So they changed the name to a friendly country and they called it English leather. And English leather by the house of Dana. Now here's the thing. If you can find these and it says Dana perfumes, that's what you want. Do not buy the ones that say new Dana perfume. That's one of the zombie house resurrections. So if you can find some of these older bottles, I'm telling you, here, we're going to actually, we are going to try to dip this in here. Okay, I think we got it. Mm-hmm. So, this gets a bad rap. Um, but for me, the reason it just barely beat out Ladis 
is because I love leather perfumes. I'm a huge leather lover. If you guys know me, it's my favorite note or chord, if you want to call it that. And this leathery, woody, there's a kefir, there's a, believe it or not, there's a kefir lime note in here, which kind of surprised me. I was not ready for that at all. That was a little bit surprising. And that kefir lime you'll find in uh, another fragrance, which I've talked about before on the channel called Shipra Siam. This is a beautiful, modern, but vintage style Shipra. It just came out uh, within the last five or 10 years, I think. But I mean, look at the real oak moss. Look at the color of the juice. That's what real oak moss absolute does to the juice. And that kefir lime note is so unique. I had no clue they were using a note like that in 1949. Kefir lime, Italian bergamot, leather, oak moss, vetiver, sandalwood, cedarwood, and musk. The only thing that's surprising about this is I was expecting more birch for a Russian leather for something that was supposed to be a Russian leather. Uh, I was expecting more birch. And I don't get very much birch here. Just a little bit. A little bit of that smoky birch. But it's leathery. It's woody. It's um, it's my kind of fragrance. I love leathers. I'm a huge fan. And so English Leather by Dana just barely edged out Ladis. Still going back and forth. Even now I'm like, should Ladis should have been number four. But it's very, very good. Very good. This is my kind of fragrance. And if you just blindfolded me and put this under my nose and I had no clue what it was called or what the value was or whatever it was, I would think this is an expensive leather fragrance. The fact that you can get this. Now, I only got a 15 mil bottle, which is more than enough for me. I don't need a whole, I don't need a whole hundred mils with my collection, but um, I'll review it before the bottle is all gone. So English leather comes in at number four. English, let me jot this down so I don't forget, English leather. Okay, English leather. Okay, so number three. Now, this is getting harder and harder and harder to, to rate these. And this is another one where I didn't really cheat, but I kind of took some liberty, okay? Because um, my bottle, as I think in 86... Somewhere in the 70s to 80s, I believe, uh, because I think they stopped making these bottles in the 80s. That's my that's my best guess. But it's a Dior creation, and uh, it is a fragrance. If you know the 1940s, uh, you probably know uh, which one it is. It is... Which one is it? Let me see. I thought I had the... Uh, I got to look up the exact... I want to look up the year... Uh, there's just so many Miss Dior's. I want to tell you what, what year. It's Miss Dior, obviously. But I want to tell you which year Miss Dior came out in. And then we can talk a little bit about which bottle I have. And I think, if you're interested in the bottles that I have, I think Anuj at Enchante has more. Okay, here we go. Miss Dior, 1947 is when it originally came out. And it's a Jean Carl's creation originally. But my bottle is the Esprit de Parfum. And the Esprit de Parfum was reworked by the great Edmund Rudnitska. Uh, sometime between the 60s and the 80s is when this bottle was around. Um, my God, man. So here's the problem with Miss Dior. It's been through so many versions. However, I can unequivocally say without any uh, asterisk, just straight up, one of the best Galvanum fragrances I've ever smelled. One of the best Shepras I've ever smelled. I am in love with this fragrance. Just a green, this green galbanum that turns into this powdery floral and then this uh, woody ambergris, you know, oak moss dry down. Uh, this version, the Esprit de Parfum, I think has more leathery facets. It has labdanum in it. I don't think the original had labdanum. And it makes it almost seem more leathery, which is better for me. More leathery. And more, um, there's almost like when you first spray, because of the mixture of the galbanum with the sage, there's sage in this, there's no sage in the original as well. Uh, and, and sage gives off this herbal green masculine feel, okay? Uh, this opens up very masculine. Galbanum with, it opens up extremely masculine, almost like galbanum and tobacco with leathery resins in, in the background. 
And then it turns into this powdery, you know, carnation, jasmine, narcissus, neroli, rose, gardenia thing. But it opens up so, oh my God. It is out of this world, man. It is so good. I wore it within the last three weeks or so. I think three or four weeks I've worn this. Um, and I'm, I, I love it. It's one of my favorite underground. And if you're a guy, do not let the fact that it says Miss Dior put you off. Do not let that put you off. I'm telling you. Try to get a bottle like mine if you can. The Esprit de Parfum. Look at the color of the juice. Oh my God. It's just succulent. It's delicious. I love Miss Dior Esprit de Parfum. So that's number three. Net leaves only two. And these are two big hitters. And again, I went back and forth. I, I made number two, number one, made number one, number two. But I, I think I have it right here. I think this is just only fair to have it this way. But trust me, number two easily could be number one if you ask me tomorrow. Number two is a creation from 1944. And it is the great Bendy from Robert P. Gay. I'm so glad to back this up. Uh, this is the my original splash bottle. This is a spray that um, my good friend Anuj from Enchante found me. I need to. I don't think I've even. I don't think I've even sprayed this bottle yet because it's supposed to be a backup. But let's spray it today for the first time. Bandi by Robert Piguet. So, ah, it's never been sprayed too. Nice. Or well, it doesn't feel like it has. Oh God. Oh, fuck. Oh, my God. Maybe this should have been number one. Uh, okay, so, basically, if you've ever heard... Um, if you've ever heard Roja describe Diaghilev, he describes it as a big Baroque Shipra. Okay, that's the word, Baroque. I think Baroque is the best word to use for Bandi. Actually, I think there's a little bit of Bandi in Diaghilev. Oh, fuck. It's just... You know what it is? It's this butch, harsh... Uh, again, galbanum. Again, just like uh, Miss Dior. You get the galbanum, but they mix it with a couple of my favorite notes. So if you know the way that tarragon is used in Aramis Aramis from 1964 for men, that's how the tarragon feels here. And so it's aldehydic opening with uh, galbanum, which makes it very green. But the galbanum here is much deeper than the galbanum from Miss Dior. It's almost like a black galbanum, okay? Imagine the galbanum is not just green, but it's black. It's dark, like the color of the bottle. And the tarragon mixed with the floral heart. The floral heart here, um, it's almost like one of the fragrances where you... Like, for example, whenever people smell Fahrenheit, they're shocked to know there's a huge amount of florals in Fahrenheit. It's almost like that. Don't worry one bit about the carnation, jasmine, rose, violet, neroli, gardenia, ylang ylang. Don't worry about that at all. You almost get none of them. At least I don't. I am so focused on the leather here. Like, this animalic, castorium, civet, resinous, myrrh-like leather. Okay? It's like, um, it's like a black leather chair in a bar that has been there for 30 years, right? And it's sat there through the decades when you used to be able to smoke in the bar. Now you can't smoke in the bar anymore, but that chair has never changed, you know? The wood is there. You know, it's almost like you can smell straight through the leather, you know, straight through the chair. Um, but this is back when they knew how to make a leather chair, too. Not nowadays, where... Not one from Ikea, okay? This is a handmade leather chair that's been passed down from generation to generation. Let's say that bar has been there for 100 years, and that chair has just been sitting there, soaking it all up, watching all of the time kind of come and go. <sighs> And, you know, there is a bit of this smoke. There's a bit of this. And, you know, I think the reason that this came, and this is marketed towards women. This and Azure by Estee Lauder are two of the fragrances that, in, that I've come across in my journey that when I found out they were marketed towards women, I almost became like cataclysmic with shock. You know, I can't believe this is marketed. God bless 
the women of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Oh, man. It's so good, though. I mean, um, sorry about this truck backing up right into my driveway. Um, yeah, it's animalic. The leather is challenging. If So, if you've smelled things like Aramis, Cabochard, um, but imagine it's done on like a leather Chypre scale. Okay, that's Bandy. They have a pure parfum. I would love to smell the pure parfum one day. But I'm in love with the Eau de Toilette version. I mean, I am absolutely in love with this. I'm so glad to have a backup. So, so glad. Oh, man. I did a top leather um, Chypre ranked video. You can go check that out if you want to know my favorite leather Chypres. This was very close to the top. Very, very close. So that only leaves one. And here's the thing. Um, this has to be number one because of the influence it's had. And, you know, it's funny, but whenever new people come to me and they want to learn about perfume, this is one of the first fragrances I tell them to go buy. Number one, it's cheap. Uh, the modern version is still good. But if you can find one of these older versions, like the bottle I'll show you today is uh, the Parfum de Toilette. And it came out in 1945 from the house of Rochas, and it's Rochas Femme. And this bottle was actually supposed to be uh, based on, what was her name? Ma Bet? Is it Ma Bet? I can't remember her name, but some fine woman from back in the day that had some serious hips, okay? And Mr. Rochas was taken with her, let's put it that way. Uh, and so this bottle is like a... Uh, symbol of, let's say, the feminine reproductive, the wide hips, right? Uh, is a little bit of that message here in the bottle shape. Uh, maybe nowadays they'd say like apple bottom, apple bottom jeans, you know? that I think they were even saying that back then. There's a little bit of that. And um, this fragrance, the reason it ended up being number one and the reason I could not put it below number one, I wanted to. I wanted to put Bandy number one because... My God, it's just, it's just heavenly. But here's the thing. I couldn't put this anything less than number one because this is one of the greatest Shepras ever. It's almost like an Oriental Shepra. It's almost like an Oriental and a Shepra blended together. And the rich, you know, fruity, wavy uh, peach, plum, apricot with cinnamon, uh, the newer bottles, I think, have cumin amped up quite a bit. This one is more about the peach, plum, jasmine, elang, amber, musk. There's civet in it as well. It's slightly animalic. Uh, so what ended up happening is this came out in 1945. And then in 1989, Olivier Cresp reformulated it. I don't have a newer bottle, but I do have the Pure Parfum. This is a... Seven and a half mil pure parfum that I got thanks to Anuj again. Anuj has dedicated heavily to the Rams, um, heavily to the Rams, and this is what the pure parfum looks like. Stunning bottle, right? Um, yeah, seven and a half mil Rochas Femme pure parfum, and you know what's funny is I like both of these equally. You might be shocked. You might think, oh, the Pure Parfum, my God. It is good, but this is just as good. And I think I paid $30 for this. This Vintage Parfum de Toilette composition. Um, I don't really know how to date it. My guess is it's from the late 80s. But I really don't know. All I know is this is one of the best. You smell just the beauty of this fragrance. And again, just like I told you with Miss Dior, do not let the fact that this says femme put you off. Don't let it put you off at all. This is, for someone that wants to explore animalic floral chypras, leathery floral chypras, this is the best. I mean, uh, one of the best. It made number one for a reason. 
you know, one of the best fragrances money can buy. And just get, I mean, I think it's also one of the best fragrances Edmund Rudnitska ever made. Uh, I would probably put Eau de Hermes ahead of this as far as my personal taste. Eau de Hermes is a masterpiece to me. Uh, and it so influenced so many fragrances in the future. Uh, Cartier's Declaration, uh, so many, I mean, you could just, so many fragrances took bits and pieces from Eau de Hermes. And, but same with Rochas Femme. And, you know, if you like fragrances like Rochas Femme, I would probably urge you to check out something like uh, MDCI Chypre Palatine. I think that Bertrand Duchefour, you know, uh, modeled Chypre Palatine after Rochas Femme, personally. That's that's my take. And, I mean, they're both Chypres, but they both have this oriental resinous kind of backbone, this ambery, benzoiny, um, vanilla, you know, in the base, if you will. And But the flowers in here, I mean, you get jasmine, may rose, ylang ylang, clove, iris, immortel even. It's so good. It's just, you know... And again, look at the color of the juice. That kind of gives you an idea. Um, so, that is my ranked top 10 fragrances from 1940s. Uh, do let me know what your favorites are. I love seeing your faces in the comments. I'm hoping to do a live stream tonight. We'll see if I can, if I have time. Uh, if I can, it'll, it'll be on these four zoologists. We'll call it the bird. It'll be the zoologist bird live stream. Because uh, we're going to do Hummingbird, Dodo, Snow Owl, Snowy Owl, and Nightingale. Four I've never smelled before. So I think it'll be cool. I'm going to try to do it tonight. If you can tune in, please do. I love seeing your faces. I love interacting with you guys. Uh, thank you so much for, you know, watching, commenting, supporting me. You know, I was looking, interestingly enough, one more thing and then I'll end the video. But I was looking at uh, some of the views. And, you know, like I did a video on this. And there was a gentleman who has, gosh, I don't know, um, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. I don't know how many. Let's just say hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And he hardly had a thousand views more than me, more than the video that I did. And we both did the video about three or four months ago. So we both did the video at about the same time. I've got less than 3,000 subs. He's got hundreds of thousands of subs. And the views speak for it all. So thank you to everyone who watches me. Uh, I, I really do feel like, you know, we've got a, a great little fragrance family. Thank you again to Eddie for sharing your collection with me, my friend. Um, I can't wait to dive into this and wear this more and, and all this good stuff. I mean, this is a, uh, this is a blessing. This is a blessing to have. And, um, again, thank you. Like I said, you are Senator rank, Eddie. You are, you are senatorial rank for sharing stuff like this, mate. So, uh, again, thanks everybody. Uh, I hate saying it, but I, ha I should force myself to say it more. Do like and comment and subscribe because the, the YouTube algorithm, even though I'm like the anti-algorithm guy, the YouTube algorithm does like that stuff. So cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you later. Bye now.